this is not for you. I still get nightmares. In fact, I get them so often I should be used to them by now. I'm not. No one ever really gets used to nightmares. For a while there, I tried every pill imaginable, anything to curb the fear. Excedrin PM, melatonin, L-tryptophan, Valium, Vicodin, quite a few members of the Barbital family. A pretty extensive list, frequently mixed, often matched with shots of bourbon, a few long rasping bong hits, sometimes even the vaporous confidence trip of cocaine. None of it helped. I think it's pretty safe to assume there's no lab sophisticated enough yet to synthesize the kind of chemicals I need. A Nobel Prize to the one who invents that puppy. I'm so tired. Sleep's been stalking me for too long to remember. Inevitable, I suppose. Sadly, though, I'm not looking forward to the prospect. I say sadly because there was a time I actually enjoyed sleeping. In fact, I slept all the time. That was before my friend Lude woke me up at three in the morning and asked me to come over to his place. Who knows? If I hadn't heard the phone ring, would everything be different now? I think about that a lot. Actually, Lude had told me about the old man a month or so before that fateful evening. Is that right? Fate? <laughs> sure as hell wasn't full. Or was it exactly that? I'd been in the throes of looking for an apartment after a little difficulty with a landlord who woke up one morning convinced he was Charles de Gaulle. I was so stunned by this announcement that before I could think twice, I'd already told him how, in my humble estimation, he did not at all resemble an airport, though the thought of a 757 landing on him was not at all disagreeable. I was promptly evicted. I could have put up a fight, but the place was a nut house anyway, and I was glad to leave. As it turned out, Chucky de Gaulle burnt the place to the ground a week later, told the police a 757 had crashed into it. During the following weeks, while I was couching in from Santa Monica to Silver Lake looking for an apartment, Lou told me about this old guy who lived in his building. He had a first floor apartment, peering out for a wide overgrown courtyard. Supposedly, the old man told Lou that he would be dying soon. I didn't think much of it, though it wasn't exactly the kind of thing you forget, either. At the time, I just figured the Lude had been putting me on. He likes to exaggerate. Eventually, I eventually found a studio in Hollywood and settled back into my mind-numbing routine as an apprentice at a ta tattoo shop. It was the end of 96. Nights were cold. I was getting over this woman named Clara English who had told me she wanted to date someone at the top of the food chain. So I demonstrated my unflagging devotion to her memory by immediately developing a heavy crush on the stripper who had Thumper tattooed right beneath her G-string. Barely an inch from her shaved pussy, or as she liked to call it, the happiest place on earth. Suffice it to say, Lude and I spent the last hours of the year alone, scouting for new bars, new faces, driving recklessly through the canyons, doing our best to talk the mid high midnight heavens down with a whole lot of bullshit. We never did. Talk them down, I mean. Then the old man died. From what I can gather now, he was an American. Though, as I would later find out, those who worked with him had detected an accent, even if they could never say for certain where it came from. He called himself Zampano. It was the name he put down on his apartment lease, and on several other fragments I found. I never, never came across any sort of ID, whether a passport, license, or other official document, insinuating that, yes, he was indeed an actual and accounted for person. Who knows where his name really came from? Maybe it's authentic, maybe made up, maybe borrowed a nom de plume, or my personal favorite, a nom de guerre. <laughs> As Lude told it, Zampano had lived in the building for many years, and though he mostly kept to himself, he never failed to appear every morning and evening to walk around the courtyard. A wild place with knee-high weeds, back then populated with over 80 stray cats. Apparently the cats liked the old man a lot, and though he offered no enticements, they would constantly rub up against his legs before darting back to the center of that dusty place. Anyway, Lude had been out very late with some woman he'd met at his salon. 
It was just after seven when he finally stumbled back into the courtyard and despite a severe hangover immediately saw something was missing. Lute frequently came home early and always found the old guy working his way around the perimeter of all those weeds, occasionally resting on a sun-beaten bench before taking another round. A single mother who got up every morning at six also noted Zampano's absence. She went off to work, Lute went off to bed, but when dusk came and their old neighbor still had not appeared, both Lude and the single mother went to alert Flays, the resident building manager. Flays is part Hispanic, part Samoan, a bit of a giant you might say, 6'4", 245 pounds, virtually no body fat, vandals, junkies, you name it. They get near the building and Flays will lunge at him like a pit bull raised in a crack house. Don't think he believes in size and strength are invincible. If the interlopes are carrying, he'll show them his own gun collection. And he'll draw on them, too, faster than Billy the Kid. But as soon as Lude voiced his suspicions about the old man, Pitbull and Billy the Kid went straight out the window. Flay suddenly couldn't find the keys. He started muttering about calling the owner of the building. After 20 minutes, Lude was so fed up with this hemming and hawing, he offered to handle the whole thing himself. Flays immediately found the keys, with a big grin, plopped them into Lude's outstretched hand. Flays told me later that he'd never seen a dead body before. There was no question there would be a dead body, and he just that just didn't sit well with Flays. We knew what we'd find, he said. We knew that guy was dead. The police found Zampano just like Lude found him, lying face down on the floor. Paramedics said there was nothing unusual, just the way it goes. Eighty-some years, and the inevitable kerplunk. The system goes down, lights blink out, and there you have it. Another body on the floor, surrounded by the things that don't mean much to anyone except the one who can't take any of them along. Still, this was better than the prostitute the paramedics had seen earlier that day. She had been torn to pieces in a hotel room. Parts of her used to paint the walls and ceiling red. Compared to that, this almost seemed pleasant. The whole process took a while. Police coming and going, paramedics attending to the body, for one thing, making sure the old man was really dead. Neighbors and eventually even flays poking their heads into gawk, wonder, or just graze on the scene that might inevitably resemble their own end. When it was finally over, it was very late. Lude stood alone in the apartment. The corpse gone, officials gone, even flays. The neighbors and other assorted snoops all gone. Not a soul in sight. Eighty fucking years old, alone in that piss hole, Lude had told me later. I don't want to end up like that. No wife, no kids, nobody at all. Not even one fucking friend. I must have laughed because Lude suddenly turned on me. Hey, Hoss, don't think young and squirting lots of cum guarantees you shit. Look at yourself, working at a tattoo shop, falling for some stripper named Thumper. And he was sure right about one thing. Zampano had no family, no friends, and hardly a penny to his name. The next day, the landlord posted a notice of abandonment, and a week later, after declaring that the contents of the apartment were worth less than $300, he called some charity to haul the stuff away. That was the night Lude made his awful discovery. Right before the boys from Goodwill or wherever they came from swept in with their gloves and hand trucks. When the phone rang, I was fast asleep. Anybody else, I would have hung up on, but Lude's a good enough friend, I actually dragged my ass out of bed at three in the morning and headed over to Franklin. He was waiting outside the gate with a wicked gleam in his eye. I should have turned around right then. I should have known something was up at the very least, since the consequence lingering in the air and the hour and Lude's stare and all of it, and fuck, I must have been some kind of moron to have been so oblivious to all those signs. The way Lude's keys rattled like bone chimes as he opened the main gate, the hinges suddenly shrieking as if they were, as if we weren't entering a crowded building but some ancient mossy and crypt, or the way we padded down the dank hallway, buried in shadows, lamps hung with spangles of light that I swear must have been the work of some gray primitive spiders. Or probably most important of all, the way Lude whispered when he told me things, things I couldn't give a damn about back then, but now. Now, well, my nights would be a great deal shorter if I didn't have to remember them. 
Ever see yourself doing something in the past, and no matter how many times you remember it, you still want to scream, Stop! Somehow redirect the action, reorder the present. I feel that way now, watching myself tug stupidly along by inertia, my own inquisitiveness or whatever else, and it must have been something else, though. What exactly? I have no clue. Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing's all... A pretty meaningless combination of words, nothing is all. But I like it just the same. <laughs> it doesn't matter anyway. Whatever orders the path of all my yesterdays was strong enough that night to draw me past all those sleepers kept safely at bay from the living locked behind their sturdy doors until I stood at the end of the hall facing the last door on the left. An unremarkable door too, but still a door to the dead. Lute, of course, had been unaware of the unsettling characteristics of our little journey to the back of the building. He had been, re he had been recounting to me in many ways dwelling upon what happened following the old man's death. Two things, Haas, Lude muttered at them as the gate glided open. Not that they make much difference, and as far as I can tell, he was right. They have very little to do with what follows. I include them only because they're part of the history surrounding Zampano's death. Hopefully you'll be able to make sense of what I can represent, though still fail to understand. The first peculiar thing, Lou told me, leading the way around a short flight of stairs, were the cats. Apparently in the months preceding the old man's death, the cats had begun to disappear. By the time he died, they were all gone. I saw one with its head ripped off, another with its gut strewn all over the sidewalk. Mostly, though, they just vanished. The second peculiar thing you'll see for yourself, Lude said, lowering his voice even more as we slipped past the room of what looked suspiciously like a coven of musicians, all of them listening intently to headphones passing around a spliff. Right next to the body, Lude continued. I found these gouges in the hardwood floor, a good six or seven inches long. Very weird. But since the old man showed no signs of physical trauma, the cops let it go. He stopped. We had reached the door. Now I shudder. Back then I think I was elsewhere. More than likely daydreaming about Thumper. This will probably really wake you out. I don't care. But one night I even rented Bambi and got a hard on. That's how bad I had it for her. Thumper was something else, and she sure beat the hell out of Clara English. Perhaps at that moment I was even thinking about the, about the, what the two would look like in a cat fight. One thing's for sure, though. When I heard Lude turn the bolts open in Zampano's door, I lost sight of those dreams. What hit me first was the smell. It wasn't a bad smell, just incredibly strong. And it wasn't one thing, either. It was extremely layered, a patina... Upon progressive patina of odor, the actual source of which had long since evaporated. Back then, it had overwhelmed me so much of it. Cloying, bitter, rotten, even mean. These days, I can no longer remember the smell, only my reaction to it. Still, if I had to give it a name, I think I would call it the scent of human history. A composite of sweat, urine, shit, blood, flesh, and semen, as well as joy... Sorrow, jealousy, rage, vengeance, fear, love, hope, and a whole lot more. All of which probably sounds pretty ridiculous, especially since the abilities of my nose are not really relevant here. What's important, though, is that this smell was complex for a reason. All the windows were nailed shut and sealed with caulking. The front entrance of the courtyard doors, all stormproofed. Even the vents were covered with duct tape. That said, this peculiar effort did not eliminate any ventilation in the tiny apartment, did not culminate with bars on the windows or multiple locks on the doors. Zampano was not afraid of the outside world. As I've already pointed out, he walked around his courtyard and supposedly was even fearless enough to brave the L.A. public transportation system for an occasional trip to the beach, an adventure even I'm afraid to make. My best guess now is that he sealed his apartment in an effort to retain the various emanations of his things in himself. Where his things were concerned, they ran the spectrum. Tattered furniture, unused candles, ancient shoes, these in particular looking sad and wounded. 
ceramic bowls as well as glass jars, small wood boxes full of rivets, rubber bands, seashells, matches, peanut shells, a thousand different kinds of elaborately shaped and colored buttons. One ancient beer stein held nothing more than discarded perfume bottles. As I discovered, the refrigerator wasn't empty, but there wasn't any food in it either. Sampano had crammed it full of strange pale books. Of course, all of them... Of course, all of that's gone now. Long gone. The smell, too. I'm left with only a few scattered metal snapshots. A battered Zippo lighter with a patent pending printed on the bottom. The twining metal ridge, looking a little like some tiny spiral staircase, winding down into the bulbless interior of a light socket. And for some odd reason, what I remember most of all, a very old tube of chapstick with an amber-like resin, hard and cracked, which still isn't entirely accurate. Though, don't be misled into thinking I'm not trying to be accurate. There were, I admit, other things I recall about his place. They just don't seem to be relevant now. To my eye, it was all just junk. Time having performed no economic alchemy there, which hardly mattered. As Lude hadn't called me over to root around these particular, and to use one of those big words I would eventually learn in the ensuing months, deracinated details of Zampano's life. Sure enough, just as my friend had described on the floor, in fact, practically dead center, were four marks, all of them longer than a hand, jagged bits of wood clawed up by something neither of us cared to imagine. That's not what Lude wanted me to see either. He's pointing at something else, which hardly impressed me when I first glanced at its implacable shape. Truth be told, I was still having a hard time taking my eyes off the scarred floor. I even reached out to touch the protruding splinters. What did I know then? What do I know now? At least some some of the horror I took away at four in the morning you now have before you. Waiting for you in the little like it waited for me that night. Only without these few covering pages. As I discovered, there were reams and reams of it. Endless snarls, words sometimes twisting into meaning, sometimes into nothing at all. Frequently breaking apart, always branching off into other pieces I'd come across later. On old napkins, the tattered edges of an envelope. Once even on the back of a postage stamp, everything and anything but empty. Each fragment completely covered with a creep of years and years of ink pronouncements. Layered, crossed out, amended, handwritten, typed, legible, illegible, impenetrable, lucid, torn, stained, scotch tape, some bits crisp and clean, others faded, burnt or folded, and refolded so many times the creases have obliterated whole passages of God knows what, sense, truth, deceit, a legacy of prophecy or lunacy or nothing of the kind. And in the end, achieving, designating, describing, recreating, finding, find your own words. I have no more. Plenty more, but why? All to tell what? Lou didn't need to have the answer. But somehow he knew I would. Maybe that's why we were friends. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did need the answer. He just knew he wasn't the one who could find it. Maybe that's the real reason we're friends. But that's probably wrong, too. One thing's for sure. Even without touching it, both of us slowly began to feel its heaviness, sense something horrifying in its proportions, its silence, its stillness. Even if it did seem to have been shoved almost carelessly to the side of the room. I think now if someone had said, be careful, we would have. I know at that moment came when I felt it certain its resolute blackness was capable of anything, maybe even slashing out, tearing up the floor, murdering Zampano, murdering us... Maybe even murdering you. And then the moment passed. Wonder in the way the unimaginable is sometimes suggested by the inanimate suddenly faded. The thing became only a thing. So I took it home. Back then, well, it's way back then by now. You could have found me downing shots of whiskey at the La Poubelle, annihilating my inner ear at Bar Deluxe, or dining at Jones with some busty redhead I met at House of Blues. Our conversation, traversing wildly from clubs we knew well to clubs we'd like to know better. I sure as fuck wasn't bothered by the old man's words. 
All those signs I just now finished telling you about quickly vanished in the light of subsequent days, or had never really been there to begin with, existing only in retrospect. At first, only curiosity drove me from one phrase to the next. Often a few days would pass before I'd pick up another mauled scrap, maybe even a week. But still I returned, for ten minutes, maybe twenty minutes, grazing over the scenes, the names, small connections starting to form, minor patterns evolving in those spare slivers of time. I never read for more than an hour. Of course, curiosity killed the cat. Even if satisfaction supposedly brought it back, there's still that little problem with the man on the radio telling me no, more and more about some useless information. But I didn't care. I just turned the radio off. And then one evening I looked over at my clock and discovered seven hours had passed. Lute had called, but I hadn't noticed the phone ring. I was more than a little surprised when I found his message on my answering machine. That wasn't the last time I lost sense of time either. In fact, it began happening more often, dozens of hours just blinking by, lost in the twist of so many dangerous sentences. Slowly but surely, I grew more and more disoriented, increasingly more detached from the world, something sad and awful straining around the edges of my mouth, surfacing in my eyes. I stopped going out at night. I stopped going out. Nothing could distract me. I felt like I was losing control. Something terrible was going to happen. Eventually, something terrible did happen. No one could reach me. Not Thumper, not even Lude. I nailed my window shut throughout the, throughout the closet and bathroom doors, storm-proofed everything, and locks. Oh, yes, I bought plenty of locks and chains, too, and even a couple dozen measuring tapes. Nailing all those straight to the floor and to the walls, they look suspiciously like lost metal rods or, from a different angle, the fragile ribs of some alien ship. However, unlike Zampano, this wasn't about smell, this was about space. I wanted a closed, inviolate, and most of all, immutable space. At least the measuring tape should have helped. They didn't. Nothing did. I just fixed myself some tea on a hot plate here. My stomach's gone. I can barely keep this honey milked up stuff down, but I need the warmth. I'm in a hotel now. My studio's history. A lot these days is history. I haven't even washed the blood off yet. Not all of it's mine either. Still caked around my fingers, signs of it on my shirt. What's happened here? I keep asking myself, what have I done? What you, would you have done? I went straight for the guns, and I loaded them, and I tried to decide what to do with them. The obvious thing was to shoot something. After all, that's what guns are designed to do, shoot something. But who or what? I didn't have a clue. There were people in cars outside my hotel window. Midnight people I didn't know. Midnight cars I'd never seen before. I could have shot them. I could have shot them all. I threw up in my closet instead. Of course, I have my own immeasurable stupidity to blame for winding up here. The old man left plenty of clues and warnings. I was the fool to disregard them. Or was it the reverse? Did I secretly enjoy them? At least I should have had some fucking inkling of what I was getting into when I read this note written just one day before he died. January 5th. 1997. Whoever finds and publishes this work shall be entitled to all proceeds. I only ask that my name take its rightful place. Perhaps you will even prosper. If, however, you discover that readers are less than sympathetic and choose to dismiss this enterprise out of hand, then may I suggest you drink plenty of wine and dance in the sheets of your wedding night. For whether you know it or not, now you truly are prosperous. They say truth stands the test of time. I can think of no greater comfort than knowing this document failed such a test. Which back then meant absolutely nothing to me. I sure as hell didn't pause to think that some lousy words were going to land me in a shitty hotel room saturated with all the stink of my own vomit. After all, as fast as I discovered, Zampano's entire project is about a film that doesn't even exist. You can look. I have. But no matter how long you search, you will never find the Navidson record in theaters, 
video stores. Furthermore, most of what it said about famous people has been made up. I tried contacting all of them. Those that took the time to respond told me that they had never heard of Will Navidson, let alone Zampano. As for the books cited in the footnotes, a good portion of them are fictitious. For instance, Gavin Young's Shots in the Dark doesn't exist, nor does the works of Hubert Howe Bancroft, Volume 28. On the other hand, virtually any dimwit can go to his library and, f and find W.M. Lindsay and H.J. Thompson's Ancient Lore and Medieval Latin Glossaries. There really was a rebellion on the 1973 Skylab mission, but La Belle Nicosi et Le Beau Chien is made up as is, as I assume, the bloody story of Caseta and Molino. Add this to my own mistakes, and there's no doubt I'm responsible for, for plenty. As well as those errors Zampano made which I failed to notice are correct, and you'll see why there's suddenly a whole lot here not to take too seriously. In retrospect, I also realized there were probably numerous people who would have been better qualified to handle this work. Scholars with PhDs from Ivy League schools and minds greater than any Alexandrian library or world net. Problem is, those people were still in their universities, still on their net, and nowhere near Whitley when an old man without friends or family finally died. Zampano. I've come to recognize now, was a very funny man but his humor was that wry desiccated kind soldier's whisper all their jokes subsurfaced their laughter amounting to little more than a tick in the corner of the mouth told as they wait together in their outpost slowly realizing that help's not going to reach them in time come nightfall no matter what they've done or what they try to say slaughter will overrun them all carrying down for vultures See? The irony is that it makes no difference that the documentary at the heart of this book is fiction. Zampano knew from the get-go what, that what's real or isn't real doesn't matter here. The consequences are the same. I can suddenly imagine a cracked voice I never heard, lips barely creasing into a smile, eyes pinned on darkness. Irony. Iron irony can never be more than our own personal Maginot line, the drawing of it, for the most part, purely arbitrary. It's not surprising, then, that when it came to undermining his own work, the old man was superbly capable. False quotes or invented sources, however, all pale in comparison to his biggest joke. Zampano writes constantly about seeing, what we see or how we see, and what in turn we can't see. Over and over again, one form or another, he returns to the subject of light, space, shape, line, color, focus, tone, contrast, movement, rhythm, perspective, and composition. None of which is surprising considering Zampano's piece centers around a documentary film called The Navidson Record, made by a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist, who must somehow capture the most difficult subject of all, the sight of darkness itself. Odd to say the least. At first, I figured Zampano was just a bleak old dude, the kind who makes Itchin scratchy look like Cowan and Hobbes. His apartment, however, didn't come close to anything envisioned by Joel Peter Witkin, or what's routinely revealed on the news. Sure, his place was eclectic, but hardly grotesque, or even that far out of the ordinary, until, of course, you took a more careful look and realized, what are all these, why are all these candles unused? Why no clocks? Not on the walls, not even in the corner of a dresser. And what's with these strange pale books and the fact that there's hardly a goddamn bulb in the whole apartment? Not even one in the refrigerator. Well, that, of course, was Zampano's greatest ironic gesture. Love of love written by the brokenhearted. Love of life written by the dead. All this language of light, film, photography, and he hadn't seen a thing since the mid-50s. He was blind as a bat. Almost half the books he owned were in Braille. Lude and Flays both confirmed that over the years the old guy had numerous readers visiting him during the day. Some of these came from community centers, the Braille Institute, or were volunteers from USC, UCLA, or Santa Monica College. No one I ever spoke with, however, claimed to know him well, though more than a few were willing to offer me their opinions. 
One student believed he was certifiably mad. Another actress, who spent a summer reading to him, thought Zampano was a romantic. Uh, she had come over one morning and found him in a terrible way. At first I assumed he was drunk, but the old guy never drank. He never had even a sip of mountain wine. Didn't smoke, either. He really lived a very austere life. Anyway, he wasn't drunk, just really depressed. He started crying and asked me to leave. I fixed him some tea. Tears don't frighten me. Later, he told me it was heart trouble. Just old heartache matters. Whoever she was, she must have been really special. He never told me her name. As I found out, Zampano had seven names he would occasionally mention. Beatrice... Gabrielle, Anne-Marie, Dominique, Eliane, Isabel, and Claudine. He apparently only brought them up when he was disconsolate, and for whatever reason dragged back into some dark tangled time. At least there is something more realistic about seven lovers than one mythological Helen. Even in his 80s, Zampano sought the company of the opposite sex. Coincidence had had no hand in arranging for all his readers to be female. As he openly admitted, there is no greater comfort in my life than those soothing tones cradled in a woman's voice. Except maybe his own words. Zampano was, in essence, to use another big word, a graphomaniac. He scribbled until he died, and while he came close a few times, he never finished anything. Especially the work he was unabashedly described as either his masterpiece or his precious darling. Even the day before he failed to appear in the dusty courtyard, he was dictating long, discursive passages, amending previously written pages, and restructuring an entire chapter. His mind never ceased branching out into new territories. The woman who saw him for the last time remarked that whatever it was he could never quite address in himself prevented him from ever settling. Death finally saw to that. With a little luck, you'll dismiss this labor. Reacted as Zampano had hoped. Call it needlessly complicated, pointlessly obtruse, prolix, your word ridiculously conceived, and you'll believe all you've said. And then you'll put it aside. And even here, just that one word aside, it makes me shudder for what is ever really put aside. You'll carry on, eat, drink, be merry, and most of all, you'll sleep well. Then again, there's a good chance you won't. This much I'm certain of. It doesn't happen immediately. You'll finish and that will be that. Until a moment will come, maybe in a month, maybe a year, maybe even several years. You'll be sick or feeling troubled or deeply in love, or quietly uncertain or even content for the first time in your life. It won't matter. Out of the blue, beyond any cause you can trace, you'll suddenly realize things are not how you perceive them to be at all. For some reason, you will no longer be the person you believed you once were. You will detect slow, subtle shifts going on all around, all around you. More importantly, shifts in you. Worse, you'll realize it's always been shifting. Like a shimmer of sorts, a vast shimmer, only dark like a room. But you won't understand why or how. You'll have forgotten what granted you this awareness in the first place. Old shelters, television, magazines, movies won't protect you anymore. You might even try scribbling in a journal, on a napkin, maybe even the margins of this book. That's when you'll discover you no longer trust the very walls you always took for granted. Even the hallways you've walked a hundred times will feel longer, much longer, in the shadows. Any shadow at all will suddenly seem deeper. Much, much deeper. You might then try as I did to find a sky so full of stars it will blind you again. Only no sky can blind you now. Even with all that iridescent magic up there, your eye will no longer linger on the light. It will no longer trace constellations. You'll only care about the darkness, and you'll watch it for hours, for days, maybe even for years, trying in vain to believe you're some kind of indispensable universe appointed sentinel, as if just by looking you could actually keep it all at bay. It will get so bad you'll be afraid to look away, you'll be afraid to sleep. Then no matter where you are, in a crowded restaurant or on some desolate street or even in the comforts of your own home, you'll watch yourself dismantle every assurance you ever lived by. You'll stand aside as a great complexity intrudes, tearing apart piece by piece all of your carefully conceived denials, whether deliberate or unconscious. 
And then, for better or worse, you'll turn. Unable to resist, though try to resist, you still will. Fighting with everything you've got not to face the thing you most dread. What is now, what will be, what has always come before. The creature you truly are, the creature we all are, buried in the nameless black of a name. And then the nightmares will begin. Johnny Truant, October 31st, 1998, Hollywood, California.